thank you for joining us for today's webinar, CI City Pipelines for Microservices Best Practices. Today's session is brought to you by CodeFresh Live. Today we'll see how you can create CI City Pipelines designed specifically for microservices and how you can reuse the same pipeline across different applications. Today our presenters are Dan Garfield, Chief Technology Evangelist, and Vidya Subramanian, Principal DevOps Evangelist at CodeFresh. Please remember to reference codefresh.io um, slash events for all of our upcoming CodeFresh Live webinars, um, as we have fresh and informative webinars for you every month. Um, so that's it for the housekeeping items. Dan, the floor is all yours. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, thanks for filling out this poll, by the way. It just helps cater the presentation so we kind of know what people are doing. Looks like most people already are using microservices in some capacity. So we're not going to spend tons of time on the why of microservices. I think that's pretty clear. We're going to get mostly into the CI CD. Um, and, uh, and then just to introduce myself, and it looks like most people here uh, looks relevant. I was looks, looks good. Okay. So just to introduce myself, um, as Terrence said, I'm the chief technology evangelist for CodeFresh. I am a Google uh, developer expert focused on cloud and Kubernetes microservices. Uh, and then I'm also a member of the Forbes technology council basically just means that I write about um, automation and microservices and uh, how to make engineering teams more effective, that kind of thing, uh, as well as creating uh, tutorials around um, things like Canary releases, Istio, all that kind of stuff. And I have a special guest joining today, Vidya, who uh, is a fairly new uh, member of the CodeFresh team. Vidya, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Um Thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone. I'm Vidya Subramanian. I'm uh, very excited to be part of CodeFresh. I uh, was uh, responsible for building a CI CD platform at Expedia Corporate Travel uh, before I uh, started my own uh, DevOps consulting business. I, I do uh, believe strongly in DevOps, have believed before the word existed, and I'm excited to be uh, part of continuing that uh, uh, evangelism uh, through CodeFresh uh, for for uh, DevOps as a as a way of thinking for uh, all software engineering. Excellent, thank you, Vidya. And um, as we go through this, if you have questions, use that Q and A button. Feel free to use the chat. Um, I feel, I feel like I should say smash that subscribe button and hit that like. Uh, but this isn't YouTube, so we're not we're not going to do that. We can skip we can skip that nonsense. Um, so uh, first off, let's talk about uh, microservices. And and my my favorite example, actually, I was just thinking about this. I've been on a huge kick with the Apollo missions because, of the course, it's the 50th anniversary this last Sunday of when we landed on the moon, which was a, an amazing engineering accomplishment. And um, so uh, thinking about microservices and monoliths, the example of Apollo 13 came to mind. Now, Apollo 13 was the third mission to land on the moon. Uh, and while they were on their way, they had an explosion in the command module. And it basically meant that the command module was dead. And uh, they had to shut everything down really quick because the batteries were gonna die and they all went into the lunar module, which is only meant to support two people for like just enough time to go down to the moon and walk around and then go back up. And uh, they ran into this problem where they didn't have a way of getting rid of the carbon dioxide in the air. And so if they didn't find a way to filter it, uh, they would actually all die. And uh, so they would asphyxiate. Now, the lunar module had a way of scrubbing the carbon dioxide from the air that was specific to the lunar module. And the command module had the same function. And they had plenty of filters for the command module because it was meant to last the entire trip, but they didn't have a lot of filters for the lunar module, which meant that they didn't have the, the pieces that they needed to get the carbon dioxide out of the air, which, uh, which was going to cause them to asphyxiate and die. So um, I like to think of these as basically two different monoliths. They're two different spaceships that are docked together and they have a very monolithic approach to design, which means they, they, uh, they basically did everything that's the same. Now, if you haven't seen Apollo 13, the movie, it's super good, you should totally watch it. Uh, and my favorite part is 
this engineer at NASA says, we need to find, make this fit into a hole made for this using only this. And so what they're doing is they have all of these filters for the command module that they could use to scrub the air from uh, the carbon dioxide out of the air, but they don't fit inside of the, the system that the, that the lunar module uses. And so this is an example of monolithic thinking, right? They built a specific different oxygen scrubbing system for each different monolith. And then when they needed to be able to use one from another, they couldn't, they had to improvise. And of course they, they saved the day, brilliant engineers um, figured out how to make an adapter for these services. But in the software world, hey, ideally let's use the same component to do all of the jobs. Let's not, let's not have to uh, reinvent the wheel for every different service that we have. And so this is, a, this is my analogy for microservices. And I think it's a good way to set up uh, Vidya's experience at Expedia and the reason that you uh, and the whole team decided to move to microservices and then how you tried to approach this from a CI CD perspective. So Vidya, why don't you take us through your experience? Yeah, th thanks Dan. So I, I love that example because uh, while we were not doing uh, spaceships or trying to get to the moon, it felt like it at that time, uh, this project was pretty, uh, uh, pretty difficult to bring multiple monoliths, which were all um, uh, mergers and acquisitions uh, of various travel products. I'm just using the example of cars here, equally applicable for flights and hotels, but there were three different products all trying to do the same thing that had uh, car searches uh, as an example, but different UI experience, different user experience as a result. Um, which was a great reason to move to uh, microservices because now these were all part of the same company. There was no reason for the duplication as well as, uh, you know, getting um, phone apps and so on. So the microservices uh, were split up um, for this uh, car search. There was a different one for search and sort and the booking service was built so that it can be used across businesses, not necessarily for cars. Um, as an example, so in this process, uh, if, you, if you see the approach we took, which is on the next slide, really uh, has the uh, consolidation of code bases going on on the, on the uh, one side, but what we really needed to do was bring together the platform whether it is for continuous integration, continuous deployment, or everything that goes within a software organization for logging, monitoring, we had to build shared services. And remember this was a few years ago before um, Spring Boot even had some of these capabilities built in and the standardization required um, a lot of in-house uh, work to, to build those shared libraries. At the same time, we were also trying to migrate to cloud from on-prem um, and, and rely heavily on manual integration testing um, throughout this process. That, uh, that was the approach being taken um, to, to bring all of these monoliths together and split into microservices. Um, uh, obviously along the way, we faced a lot of, uh, lot of issues. Um, the teams were geographically distributed. That's always a problem, but uh, at the same time, you, you need to build tool sets that alleviates that problem. Um, I don't know how many of you in this um, uh, session are, are in situations where you know the build is happening, this um, CI uh, is happening, but the consumers or the integration testing is happening in another uh, zone and, and you need um, more automation to bring all of this together. Um, and that's the only way for geographically distributed teams to, uh, to be successful. So we'd love to hear some feedback on, on um, your situation there, as well as um, uh, the tools had to be consolidated, even though people were gen on Jenkins, in some cases, there were different instances, with different versions of it, different versions of Nexus. One team um, was, uh, was, entirely uh, using homegrown proprietary. I mean, this is, we're talking about original Expedia code base from uh, back when it was part of Microsoft. So all of these need to be consolidated and, and the pipelines as a result in, the, in this new world, um, 
when we were moving to microservices with you know each microservice having three to four branches at least uh, there was an explosion of the ci cd pipeline from even a hundred is, is a lot, but uh, at least it was manageable across across the teams. But um, uh, now with the move to microservices, it meant that we were constantly um, needing to update because these were not built modular. They were not as reusable as we would have liked it to be. And on top of that, uh, uh, General Jenkins uh, issues with master and slave uh, uh, the slowness and the context um, uh, all running within the Jenkins master for the CI pipeline slowing us down. Many of it caused by what we used to call the copy pasta uh, problem, uh, bad patterns of uh, copy pasting, which copy pasting works only to a certain extent across microservices when um, the teams were all trying to migrate to the new code base and build the CI CD pipeline at the same time. This was becoming um, really hard for a central team, which was uh, sort of my team's responsibility as a director of engineering. I was staring at this global um, uh, organization of engineers constantly asking for my team to keep up. And we were becoming the bottleneck um, because the pipelines were, were not able to to scale uh, to the needs of the global organization. Um, we, we took the approach which we have, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, main one being, uh, let's rely on a Maven's modularity, which helped a lot. Um, Maven does uh, help bring some of the best practices. Some of this was happening pre-container um, uh, era event. So we, we weren't on, uh, in any form of containers, at least Docker wasn't popular, even though there were other containers prior to that. Um, so we weren't able to leverage some of the best practices that are available um, since then. And, and later, uh, Dan will be sharing some of the best practices with um, containers as well. Uh, the, the net net is that a lot of lessons learned, which we have in the uh, next slide, uh, through these issues faced. Uh, the lessons uh, really uh, made us realize that the engineering teams that were building the microservices uh, should have been able to prioritize CI CD templating as a top business need. It's not different from building out cars. They are not two separate problems. It doesn't belong in, in another organization. So to be able to really, so the, to me, that's a very key um, lesson because that was significantly slowing down uh, when you rely on a, on a central team to bring all of that together for the rest of the organization. And that was slowing down the, um, uh, the adoption or the, or the standardization of CICD. And, and later, again, you, you will see as part of, um, uh, part of what uh, Dan is sharing is that at that time when we were building all of this, um, which was a few years ago, not all of the uh, best practices or tooling were um, either the tooling wasn't available or the best practices it was a chicken and an egg problem build versus buy we were trying to build all this ci cd platform while all the microservices were being stood up by a, a, a variety of teams globally so uh, in order to really bootstrap these projects which is my second bullet point on recommendation is you really need to externalize sort of that CI, CD thinking the best of your capabilities, but at the same time, give it very high priority to bootstrap. Don't, don't let that uh, sort of straggle and say, oh, I need to take care of my uh, backlog item, which is to build the sort service versus, you know, let me wait on building out CI, CD. Um, but there, um, uh, the, the reusability approach um, through a buy um, uh, model, uh, could have um, also been quite helpful um, as well in, in hindsight uh, because we were trying to um, keep up with the rest of the team uh, by building all of this uh, ourselves. Um, I'm, I'm hoping um, that through the rest of the webinar today, uh, and Dan is going to start showing some of the best practices which we had 
in Maven, but now we are able to uh, provide through CodeFresh. Perfect. Thank you, Vidya. Yeah, and I think that the experience that you had at uh, Expedia really mirrors what we've seen from tons of companies. Um, and it makes intuitive sense, right? We, as you go to microservices using shared libraries, pretty standard uh, procedure. Uh, but as you mentioned, it does lead to a number of problems. So I'm going to show you how we actually have done this for CodeFresh, which, which runs on microservices. So uh, this is going to be kind of a look at how we do our internal engineering processes um, as, as the backdrop here. So, so first, just to reiterate, right? When we're using a monolithic application, you typically have a pipeline or a several pipelines for just that application. And it's okay that it's complex or difficult to maintain. It's okay that it's fragile because at the end of the day, you only have one of them. You only have one monolith. It's not a big deal for, it, for this to not be a scalable, super easy to use process because you don't need it to be because you only have one monolithic application. Um, and so you usually often have it led by a single team. And I marked here that, that, that this is actually kind of anti DevOps. And I, I marked that because what it basically says is that the uh, engineers don't have as much input into the deployment process as they should. Um, because it's essentially one team that just dictates how everybody's going to work. Now, that's not really a great way to work. Uh, and ideally, you can find a better way to work when it comes to microservices. Now, to understand this problem, if we took this same approach and kept it going to microservices, we would get in big trouble really fast. Let's say we had three monolithic applications, and we're going to split each of those up into several microservices. All of a sudden, we have exponentially grown the number of pipelines that we need to maintain. Now, with our original approach, with a single team that manages the pipeline for everybody, is this going to work? <laughs> no, it's going to be a nightmare, uh, right? That's what Vidya found uh, uh, when, when uh, this is kind of the approach at Expedia. All of a sudden, they had thousands of pipelines. And if something broke, it was very, very troublesome and uh, hard to maintain, hard to scale, hard to keep everybody working. Now, the whole point of these CI CD pipelines is that we want to keep people working smoothly so they can just focus on, on writing code. They don't have to worry about, uh, about the process going forward, right? Um, so this shared, this shared uh, pipeline segments approach, it's not a great solution because it relies on shared libraries. Now, many of you, uh, uh, based, on, based on the poll results here, uh, have implemented Jenkins. You've gone through the process of adding plugins and things. The problem with those things is that they all run globally. And so if you have uh, 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 something like, uh, let's say kubectl, right? You need to have that installed. Well, it relies on Python 2. And then you have a test suite that relies on Python 3. And all of a sudden, you have a version conflict. You have a problem. And uh, what ends up happening a lot of times with these shared libraries is that they rely on each other in a complex way um, that different teams will need to use a different version. And so one team will upgrade their library and all of a sudden this will break everybody else's pipelines and, and everybody knows this. I mean, if you've ever upgraded a plugin uh, in Jenkins, you've, you've experienced this, this problem where you go to upgrade a plugin and it turns out that several other things rely on it, but they're not compatible with the new version. And oh, whoops, we just broke somebody's pipeline over here. This is, this is a really big problem. And uh, what we end up seeing is that teams that try to keep the monolithic approach to pipelines in their organizations will end up, and if you're doing it on Jenkins, they will end up spawning Jenkins instances. You will proliferate Jenkins all over the place where instead of having one Jenkins instance, all of a sudden you have 200 Jenkins instances, one running for each different microservice, different team, because they have different tools, different configuration. And it's because the shared library system is a broken and bad model. It's a really, really wrong way to do it. Now, the idea of having reusable components, that's not a bad idea. That's a great idea. It's just that shared libraries are a bad way to do it. And this is kind of what Vidya was sharing earlier when she was talking about how plugins would break all the time, the central team couldn't maintain the libraries. Um, you know, if you needed to upgrade a library, you had to go and talk to like an admin. They had to approve it. Then they would upgrade it. And then this would cause other people's stuff to break. 
it's a bad way to do it. It doesn't make sense. Um, and it's, it's because the shared library approach is almost like, it's almost like the idea of microservices on the face, but really it's a monolithic approach, right? It's saying everything needs to be in the same application. It's not the way microservices are meant to work. Microservices are meant to do everything that they need to do within their box and nothing else. And they don't, they don't affect other things. They just do their one job. So that's what, uh, that's, that's something that we can actually solve. So this, this organizing pipelines for monolithic applications, is a big fail, um, requires everybody to use the same version of the libraries. We basically talked about all these issues, uh, it leads to a lot of stability problems. And at the end of the day, your productivity falls in the toilet and it's, it's a big, uh, big fail. It's really, really hard to do really, really hard to pull off. Uh, uh, if you disagree, shout it in the chat. <laughs> all right. So how do we do this? Um, well, we're going to talk about three lessons that we took when we kind of looked at the, the, the model that Expedia had followed and we did a lessons learned and then we built it fresh for microservices from the ground up. Now, luckily the nice thing about CodeFresh, when we built our platform, we built it from micro for microservices for day, from day one. So we never had to go through the migration pain, which obviously does cause some of these extra issues, but uh, we're going to show, uh, I think uh, three, essential items. Now to, to understand the usefulness of the items, I just wanted to share, this is the CodeFresh stack. Now this is actually isn't everything. We have a lot more microservices running than just this, but this gives you an idea of how we work. We have a complex microservice based architecture. We have dozens and dozens of microservices. We support a ton of different runtime environments. We've got tons of integrations. Uh, we have a built-in Docker registry, we have a built-in Helm chart repository, we have services to do authorization, we have user management, we have role-based access controls, we have, uh, we have audit logs, we have all of these different systems and services to maintain. And, uh, you know, as a team, we don't have thousands of engineers to work on all this. So we need to be really efficient with how we build this service and how we maintain it. So uh, the first trick that I wanna share as a best practice is that you should use container-based pipelines. Now, what does this mean? It means that for each step in your pipeline, you have all of the essential components boiled down into a single container. Those containers can be self-service, right? So you can just grab any image that you wanna use and stick it in your, in your pipeline and run it. And these images do not rely on each other. The big benefit of containers is isolation. So we have all of the isolation built into each step. Each Docker image does only the job it's supposed to do and nothing more. Other Docker images don't call it. It just does its job and moves on into the next one. This is a microservice based approach to pipelines is to rely on the container based pipeline. Now, uh, to do this and to pull it off in a really great way, uh, the thing that we actually built into CodeFresh as a platform is we have a shared volume so that every container, even though it's operating isolated, they all access the same shared volume. So if I do something like a Git checkout in one step, in the next step I can do my build because they have access to the same volume, even though they're separate containers. Um, and this is, this is a fantastic setup because it also means that we, can, we have caching built in with that volume, we just cache that volume. We've built a lot of rules around how the volume is handled. So you actually don't have to write anything to handle caching. It's done automatically. All the optimization is done automatically, which is nice. Now to do this, we actually have an open source library of steps that you can use. It's at steps.codefresh.io. I just want to show you super fast um, some of these steps. These are all Docker images with a schema. That's what they do. So if we look at some of these, um, you can see there are some official ones. These are ones that are built and maintained by CodeFresh. Now to be in this library at all, you do need to go through a qualification process and a security scan process. Um, so these, are, these uh, should all be considered safe. Obviously these official ones are ones that CodeFresh built and maintained, but looking at a, a community maintained one, for example, this one's uh, a Kubernetes Canary deployment. This does Canary releases to Kubernetes. Now you can see this is actually listed as a type step and it just takes some arguments to do its job. And if we look at the source code, you'll actually be able to see what image it's using. Now you can actually just pull and use this Docker image. And this is the same for all of these things. You can actually just pull these Docker images and use them. And if you look uh, at this example here, 
This actually shows the Docker image that's being used. This is coming just off of Docker Hub, so you can actually go and examine it yourself. Um, and uh, what we've done here is, is in this step, you have everything that you need in order to do a canary release to Kubernetes. So I can reuse this step over and over again, and I can select the version that I want to use independent of anybody else. So instead of referencing a shared library, which is being maintained and changed and has to work well with all of the other shared libraries, I'm referencing an artifact that knows how to do a job and it runs completely isolated. Now this means that it's so much easier to build my pipelines because I'm just cobbling together containers and plugging them together and it's good to go. If I needed to maintain thousands of pipelines, this would make my life a million times easier. Now, I'm not saying you should, because we actually do have a way to eliminate a lot of those pipelines. But if you did need to, um, this, this would make the maintenance and the, uh, the, the care of this pipeline much, much easier uh, to use. Um, so you can see there's this whole library. You're welcome to use these. They're free. They're open source. Uh, they, most of them don't rely on CodeFresh even. They, they're basically just Docker images that take arguments. Uh, so you could use them uh, locally, you could use them in your own tools, you can grab them and, and we encourage you to do that. We're a big believer in open source and that's uh, one of the contributions that we've made. Um, all right, so let's look at the next component. My, I see somebody asked a question, but my Q&A isn't pulling up for some reason. It's like, it's like yeah, hiding question, out somewhere. The question is, are you saying each pipeline step is a separate container? Yes. Each pipeline step is its own separate container. And you can create your own custom steps and you can use them in your pipeline, which I'm gonna, I'll show you in just a minute. And in order to, the knowledge that you need to make your own custom step is how to make a Docker file. Like that's, that's basically it. Um, so, uh, so essentially any, there's no, that, you don't need to know the CodeFresh API. There's nothing special there. Um, it's basically just knowing how to make a Docker image that does a job. So let's, let's come back uh, and I will show you this uh, a little bit more in depth in our demo portion um, in just a minute. Uh, okay, so the second component is that rather than making templates, like pipeline templates, you could actually use a single pipeline that operates in different contexts. Now, what's the difference between a single pipeline and a single template? Well, a template is something that you give to people and they take it and adapt it. Uh, and the problem with that is that you, you get into version creep, um, people start doing different things and they get, they get off base and you try to update the template and they don't get the changes. So it's, it's, templates are really things for getting started. In this case, we, we actually are gonna use a single pipeline to do all of our CI tasks. Uh, and the great thing about this is this works really well for any microservices that are uniform and as you scale, you actually do want to make your microservices uniform. Now, when I say that they're uniform, does that mean they have to use the same language? No, not necessarily. But if you use a container plus something like a Helm package, um, et cetera, you actually have a very standard way of operating with these artifacts. Uh, and then we just change the behavior of the pipeline based on the context. So what comes with the context? So here, I've got a pipeline. It, it's, it has a number of steps that are gonna run. And you can see the way that the trigger works is it brings a code base and that code base can contain tests. It can contain a Docker compose file, a Helm chart, and contain dependencies. It can contain uh, everything that we need so that when the pipeline checks out that code, it knows which tests to run. It knows where it's going to be deployed to. It knows all those components. Uh, so this, um, this actually carries the context. And I'm going to show you this in the demo. And I'm going to show the, the, as well as the first thing. Now, I'm actually gonna open up CodeFresh and we use CodeFresh to build CodeFresh. So this is CodeFresh on top of CodeFresh. This is how we build CodeFresh using CodeFresh. Uh, it's a circular thing, uh, but that's how it works. Uh, and I'm gonna pull up um, one of our most popular pipelines. Uh, this is a project we have that's called codefresh.io slash pipelines, uh, where we keep a lot of shared pipelines. Now this is a single pipeline that's used for lots of different microservices. Uh, and we actually have two of them. We have one for CI and we have one for CD. So one for continuous integration, one for continuous deployment. So I'm gonna pull up the CI pipeline and show you how this operates. And uh, this, this really is a fantastic way to build a pipeline. 
uh, because it's so much easier to maintain um, and it makes it really easy to add new projects and get them up and running very quickly. So uh, my computer's been running a little slow today, so uh, any, any slow loading I think is just on my end. Um, uh, let me know if you have a different experience, but uh, I, I had some weird background tasks running. I think, uh, I think I might be Bitcoin mining, I don't know, uh, but uh, we gotta figure that out after the, uh, after the, after the webinar, so sorry about that. Um, all right, so this is pulling up a pipeline. And what we're going to see is that uh, over here on the left, we see the definition of this pipeline. Now, this is actually coming from Git. So you can actually see this is referencing a code repository that we have. It's a private repository that we have. And we have a CI node YAML. Now, this is CI for node applications uh, in this case. Um, now, does this mean that our all of our services are node? No. but we managed to group together a, a, a few dozen of our, of our microservices into a single pipeline. And that just eliminates a whole bunch of pipelines that we would have to maintain otherwise. Now, the first thing that you see in this pipeline, the first step, this is a type step that's that git clone step. Now we saw that in the, in the code fresh steps library a minute ago. So this is a standard step. It's basically a Docker image that knows how to do a git checkout uh, and adds variables and things like that. And you can see, one of the arguments that we have is the repo and the repo we have hard coded and said only check out stuff from codefresh.io. That's a good little security measure though, though we could probably just always infer it uh, because the triggers and the way they're set up. And then it specifies the repo name. Now this repo name comes from the trigger. So over here on the right hand side, you can see I've got a whole bunch of triggers and basically these are all, uh, push commits to different repos, different applications. These are all just different microservices that we have here. And each one that pushes in, it pulls the context automatically and checks out the correct code base. And from there, all of the other components are sitting in that code base. And so all the tests, the Helm chart, all those components are sitting in the, in the code base for all the different microservices and they can operate the way that they need to automatically. And so when we go to add a new project, the only thing we have to do is add a trigger. Once we add the trigger, it'll automatically check it out. It'll automatically follow the rest of the process. Now, obviously it needs to have a, every, every project in this, uh, that uses this shared pipeline needs to have a Docker image. It needs to have a Helm chart. It needs to have tests that can run. And then we'll sh I'll show you some of the standard steps that we do here. So this, this shows all these different triggers feeding in. Now, if you were using mono repo, that's totally fine because what we would do is we would still have separate triggers for each project, uh, except let me pull up my interface here. Yeah. So what I, what I was going to show is that when you create a Git trigger, there is actually a little option where you can set a filter for mono repo. So you can basically say only trigger this when stuff in this subfolder changes. Uh, so that's, that's a nice thing you can do. If you're using mono repo, that works. If you're not using mono repo, that's fine too. Um, either way, either way is fine. Go here. Okay. So this CI pipeline, and we're going to go look at a build here. Um, it basically does, it handles the job. It's one pipeline that handles tons of microservices, which is a really fantastic way to do this. Uh, so now this, this platform actually runs really fast, but right now zoom is literally taking 150% CPU. That's crazy. All right, so I can see all my pipelines that have been running here, and you can see that we have tons that have been running today. Uh, we're, we're pretty busy. We've got all of our engineers working. So I'm gonna open up this random pipeline here. I haven't looked at this one yet, but it's the same pipeline, just operating with different contexts. So I can see that this one is actually working on uh, SAS end-to-end -end as part of the CFUI repository. So this actually tells me the context of the pipeline that's operating. Now, the first thing it does is that git clone checkout. And then these next two steps basically just pull variables out of that repo and load them in so that it knows what to do. It's gonna validate a version. It can optionally create a pull request if it's needed. If we look at the YAML here, um, it basically is gonna tell us when, uh, oops. it's gonna tell us when it needs to run. Um, it's going to install the test dependencies. So this is using yarn because these are all node services, but if you were using Java, 
Of course, you would have your uh, uh, a Java test suite, and you could have these all actually sitting in the same pipeline. It just needs to know to look for each one of them. Um, so you could actually just pull out and say, oh, is this a Java project? Is this a Node project? You could still use the same pipeline. Um, and then we're going to run some linting, we're going to run some unit tests, and then here we actually execute a composition. Now, in this, in this pipeline, this was actually skipped, um, but this, uh, this composition will basically take the Docker Compose that's sitting inside of the repository and spin up the required service to do integration testing. So this is a great way to handle microservice dependency testing. Uh, we do a security scan on all of these. Uh, we have in our library, we have TwistLock, we have Aqua, uh, we have several others, and, and we do strongly recommend doing security scans by default on all, your, on all the uh, images that you create. In this case, we actually have a, a flag set up so that it's flagging that uh, there is a minor vulnerability in this one that should be addressed, but it's not enough to keep us from deploying. We generate some test reporting, we build our Docker image, and we push the image up to uh, Helm registry, and we build a Helm chart. Now, these last two steps are especially important because these are the things that are going to trigger our deployment pipeline. Now, I want to back up really quick. I'm going to just look at another one. Um, because as you can see on all these different pipelines, if they have a test suite, you can actually see the test report right here. So in this case, we're going to jump in and look at what tests are running for this service. Uh, again, I haven't looked at this specific service. Um, so we'll see what's in here. Uh, uh, so this one has about 3,000 different test cases, excuse me, that it runs. Um, if we look at the test suites, we'll see that there are a whole bunch of different test suites running here. Things to test uh, different APIs, things to test different integrations, um, all these different components, uh, basically making sure that everything is working smoothly. And if we look at our graphs, we can actually see that the, uh, the trend has been that um, the time for these tests has typically been pretty fast and uh, and it's uh, been running smoothly. So this is a, this is a great test report. We're, we're pretty happy with this service. Now, uh, coming back over. So we've created this single CI pipeline. We have all these different triggers that feed into it. Now, when it comes to deployment, we actually handle that with a different pipeline. So at the very end of this, we build a Helm package and we push it up into, uh, we actually save it in our, our Helm chart repository. Now, if you're not using Helm, that's fine. Um, but, but these principles are gonna stay the same uh, regardless. So I'm gonna come back uh, to my pipeline view and we're gonna go and look at the CD pipeline. I'll show you how we do this. Um, now, are all of our microservices in this one pipeline? No but it does cover a large swath of microservices. And I have, uh, I've seen uh, uh, basically customers using this where they have 60, 70 microservices and they always, always, always use one pipeline and they just maintain it. Now that's really cool because um, unlike the monolithic pipelines that we saw, these are easier to maintain, branching is easier. And if somebody did need to pull out and replicate functionality, they can actually do that with the Docker-based pipeline approach. Uh, and that was, that's gonna be more scalable. So I'm gonna to switch to the CD pipeline here. And what you're gonna see is that the triggers are going to change. Instead of looking at git commits, it's going to look at artifact changes. So in this case, we're building a Helm chart repository and we're pushing up into the Helm chart registry. Uh, and then once that Helm chart is pushed, that triggers the continuous delivery pipeline to actually go out and deploy. So here you can see, uh, on this on this side, um, these are these are actually triggers to our Helm chart repositories uh, that are going to operate, uh, and that's what's going to trigger the deployment. And if we if we go and look at the build, of course we have everybody using the same one again. Now let's look at the build, and I'll show you what's actually going on in the pipeline. Um, so you get to see actually the last time we deployed to production was two hours ago. You can see there's also a test report for this. Uh, so if we looked at this, this would show us the results of the uh, tests that happened after we went to production. But I'm gonna open up this pipeline. And here we can see the first thing that it does is it spins up a test environment. Now what this basically does is it deploys a one-off uh, instance of the Helm chart with all its dependencies uh, so that we can run tests on it. Um, it has a little wait step and a deployment status check where it basically double checks to make sure there's no deployments going on. If there are, 
then it won't start a deployment. You don't want to deploy over the top of something that's being deployed at the same time. Um, and then we actually have a manual approval step in some cases where if this is required, this will trigger a Slack alert and we'll basically get an approve or deny. Now, in this case, it wasn't needed uh, because it didn't meet the conditions. And if we look at the, uh, if we look at the YAML, we can actually see what that was. I think uh, I'm zoomed in a little bit. It's causing a little bit of grief. There we go. Okay, so you can see in this case that uh, only when it's going to production and only if there's some sort of invalid deployment state from the last case. So this, this prevents us from trying to deploy over something that's broken and um, making it more broken. Uh, and then we basically do our deployment. We send some notifications and we run our end-to-end -end testing. Now, each one of these steps that you see here is running in its own container, its own step. So this is a fantastic way to work. Uh, you can see that we're doing end-to-end -end tests on our deployed environment so we can actually validate um, that everything is running properly. So we have a CI pipeline, we have a CD pipeline, and this covers uh, a large swath of our microservices in CodeFresh. Now, one of the things I was gonna show really quick, if I go back to my CD pipeline, um, one of the questions that was asked was earlier was about creating your own custom steps, your own custom images. So I'm just going to show you how this looks uh, in CodeFresh. If I go over here, there's this steps tab, and this is going to show me everything that's available at steps.codefresh.io, as well as any custom steps that I've made. So if I open that up, give it just a second here. What a bummer to have a slow computer. It's literally like I can see in other applications. It's not, it's not this. Okay, so here's the steps. Uh, this shows me my whole library. Let's say that I wanted to pull something from Vault. Uh, I can actually just filter this. This will show me that I've got Vault right here. I can grab this and drop it in. And so this is basically a Docker image with a schema. Having some issues with my computer sucking. is here uh, but you get the idea it's, it will create my my steps here for me gosh uh, and then I have this my steps here now uh, I actually don't have any in here but I can create my own custom steps to share with my team that will all sit inside of here so if they're going to create a pipeline that's actually available to them so this shows uh, both both of those principles uh, reasonably well right now the third thing that I talk briefly about um, uh, before we kind of come up on the end here, is that the the other thing we recommend as you move to microservices is that you start doing things like canary releases. Now, the principle of a canary is fairly simple. Uh, basically, you deploy a new version of your application alongside the current production version, and you send a portion of your traffic to that new version in order to validate and test it. Now, the reason you do this is because testing early right, running tests, running unit tests, running even integration tests, this is the most useful when your infrastructure is less complex. As your infrastructure gets more complex, right, you have 300 microservices. Well, now it's kind of difficult for you to spin up the entire stack and run all of the tests with everything for every single change because it just gets costly, it's prohibitive. Uh, and so what you could actually do instead is use canary releases. So you'll do your normal testing. You'll validate everything you can before you go to deployment. But when you do deploy, you add in the additional step of only giving it to a percentage of your traffic. And if there is an issue, you automatically roll back. Now this prevents downtime. It allows you to move a lot faster and it gives you a lot more confidence when you deploy that you're not going to have an outage um, or, or some big regression that causes uh, big pain for users. Now, um, if you do want to learn more about Canary, we actually have a whole webinar just on this at codefresh.io slash events. You can just search for Canary there and you'll see uh, there's, there's a couple of videos that you can watch that go through this actually really in depth and from a technical perspective, how to pull it off. Um, but, uh, but that's a principal thing. So in summary, uh, shared pipelines, that works a lot better than shared libraries because you can maintain a pipeline and everybody can use it and it can just pull in the context that it needs to operate on. Whereas shared libraries are always stepping on each other causing issues, it's a big problem. Um, reusable Docker images, way better than that copy pasta problem because you're not, you're not copying and pasting code, 
you're, you're reusing a step that's already been defined and you can handle the versioning of that step independent of anybody else. So if I want to use one that's two versions behind it, lock it, I can do that. Somebody upgrading isn't going to cause me downtime. Uh, and then lastly, deployment validation with Canary, very, very valuable. Now this uh, webinar covers a lot of topics, but if you want a little bit deeper on continuous deployment, CI CD pipelines with microservices, there is a full blog post on this. If you just search for CodeFresh, microservice, CI, best practice, uh, it'll come up, but the link is here and we'll, we'll, uh, it's in the chat as well, so you can grab it there. Uh, fantastic. So um, with this, let's get into questions. And I actually want to invite uh, Kostas uh, onto our panel here. Uh, Kostas, if you wanna join, that'd be fantastic. You can help us answer some questions and then um, I'll help uh, MC some of these questions. Um, so we would encourage you, uh, the principles that we talked about today, they aren't unique to CodeFresh. You can do them with other platforms. However, we do make it really, really easy to do it. So please go create a free account at CodeFresh.io to try this stuff out. You can request a demo and you'll get a one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, with our solutions architects. And then I'm also going to put up a questionnaire while we're answering questions just basically asking you what you thought about this webinar, if, and if, it, if it was useful for you. So please, um, that helps us know if we did a good job or not. If we didn't, then the next time we do a webinar, hopefully we can do better. Um, so with that, let's uh, take some of these questions. Um, so first question uh, is for you, Vidya. Um, the, the question is, do you think that uh, your pain points at Expedia would have been resolved if you had followed this shared pipeline, uh, container-based pipeline approach? Sure. Uh, I, th thanks for uh, the question. I think the, uh, the main pain point that, that, it, uh, that it solves is the uh, CICD platform that CodeFresh provides. Um, the best practices, some of this, in fact, we were using but had to hand build all of that using Maven, right? Maven has a lot of modularity. So a lot of these best practices we were following, but the effort it took for that best practice to be actually built out is, is really the, um, the issues we were facing, if, if that makes sense. Whereas CodeFresh um, is uh, literally making it all available out of the box so you can hit the ground running um, like way faster. Yeah, very fair, very fair. Um, this next question is for, uh, for you, Costas. The question is, do you have any tips for making these Docker images, for making these steps that are scalable and reusable? So, hello, everybody. I'm Costas. I'm also a developer advocate at CodeFresh. I have been trying to answer all the questions that have been coming in the Q&A. Now, to answer this particular question, um, all these Docker images that we use are just generic Docker images. Uh, you can find actually the source code for all the plugins that you have seen. And you can see that they are not specific to CodeFresh. So even though it's very easy to use them in CodeFresh, they, they are not tied to the platform. You can create a Docker image with any programming language that you want, uh, any tool that you want. You can write a CodeFresh plugin like in, in Haskell if you'd like. My general advice would be to make it like simple, maybe package a single executable, maybe you already have a CLI for a tool that you want to integrate. So the very natural um, candidate for the Docker image is to just package the CLI in the Docker image and execute it from there. And we see that most external platforms, either they have a CLI already there for you or they have an API. So try with the, let's say, simplest thing possible, just package it and use it. But of course, your Docker image can be as complex as you want. So if you have many uh, dependencies, you can package them there. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and, and we actually have seen, this is a model that we've been building off of for the last three years. And it is uh, just night and day so much better to use container-based pipelines. I always say it's like building pipelines with Legos instead of trying to fashion them out of clay. I mean, it's just, once, you, once you've created that artifact, you can just use it. Uh, and, uh, and you know, it's going to be reliable. And it's going to be what you want. Um, so the next question comes from uh, CMOS. Uh, shared pipelines are better than shared libraries. How do you maintain your pipelines? Are there some auto-updating mechanisms? 
Uh, well, as far as I know, we don't have anything automatic there. If you have seen the, the demo, most of the services have actually two pipelines, the CI and the CD pipeline. So even though the number of microservices is big and we have many microservices as a platform, the number of pipelines that we have in the end is just two. Maybe we have some additional uh, pipelines. And that's the whole point of all this discussion, to reduce the number of pipelines that you want to manage. So if you have only two, there is nothing you know, to auto-update. You can just go there and change it. Yeah, now from the, from the perspective of maintaining uh, steps, steps you can specify a version that you want to use. And, um, and then if, you're just, if you don't specify the version, of course, you'll be using the latest version. Uh, and so uh, depending on what you're doing and what the steps are and who's maintaining it, um, you, you may want to version those. But in general, I think that people will just use the latest version and that works pretty well because, because those Docker images are so tied to the specific job that they do. Um, now that the different, the, the one use case I can think of where it, where it is really different is with Helm uh, or with Terraform because they don't like different versions. So I, if I'm using like Terraform, the, a Terraform image, I wanna specify the version that I wanna use. Same thing with Helm uh, so that it doesn't like change uh, it's just going to work better if I can specify the version. So that's something that you can do and maintain for your own pipelines. Um, uh, if you're not using like a shared pipeline like this, um, let's see. Then, uh, next question, uh, was, do you have any examples of pipeline step templates that use variable replacement for code reuse? Uh, and yeah, I want to say on our homepage, there are, an ex there is, I think seven or eight different examples of pipelines and they use variables pretty heavily um, to, to work because they're all designed so you could actually just throw them into your own, uh, your own workspace and have them operate for you as long as the triggers are there. Um, so that's a, that's a great question. Anything you guys want to add to that? No, okay. Um, another question, do you keep static Docker images since we have been seeing changes in Docker Hub Python images that change within the current release. Do you keep static Docker images that change with the release? Ah, okay. so, so I think the answer here is that uh, the plugins themselves are open source and they are public and all of them are in, in Docker Hub, but you are free, you know, in your own organization to use your private Docker images as uh, plugins and there you can version them as you want and keep whatever version you, you need and make whatever you need. And you can mix and match. So you can have a pipeline that is using uh, public maybe Docker images for, for Python, but then for uh, Node, you use your own Docker images that exist only in your, in your private Docker registry. Uh, if you have also seen the slide, it's CodeFresh account automatically comes with a private Docker registry. So it's very easy out of the box to create your own steps and uh, store them there. And they are private just for you. Yeah, very good. And when it, when it comes to the versioning of, uh, of the steps and images, I think that there, there may be two different strategies. So for something like Terraform, when you set a version on that image, what you're really saying is uh, like, if it's, it would be like Terraform and the tag would be like 1.2. What you're really saying is this is the image to use if you're using Terraform 1.2. And so that one could be updated. Now you could have additional point tags underneath that if you really want it. Um, but then there are other cases where uh, like, for example, with the Canary release, um, new versions that we would make there would be specifically around functionality or, or, uh, uh, or bug fixes or things like that. So they would typically be, um, you know, upgraded based on that. So that's a little bit of an incomplete answer. Hopefully that's enough. Uh, if, if, if not, then uh, shout in the, uh, in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, question uh, was, will, it, will CodeFresh work with other tools uh, like Jenkins, like Team Cities. Now, so CodeFresh is a CI and City platform. Now, it, we actually do have an integration with Jenkins. If you wanted to trigger CodeFresh jobs from Jenkins, you can. If you want to trigger uh, Jenkins jobs from CodeFresh, you can. Truthfully, that's not very popular. Typically, people replace Jenkins with CodeFresh. Um, with Team City, uh, there is an integration with the Git repository component. So if you make changes, you can set up your triggers uh, to the Git repos that you have. I think they're now called like Azure DevOps 
repos or something. I can't quite keep up with their naming convention. Uh, of course, it works with Bitbucket, with GitHub, with GitLab. Um, it works with all those things. Uh, so there's there's a ton of integrations for CodeFresh that are, are going to work pretty seamlessly. Um, there was a good question, and I think you already answered in the chat, Kostas, but there was a question of what's the best way to get started if I want to try CodeFresh? Um, and uh, what should I look for? Um, my, my first reaction is, uh, if you've got more than 10 engineers in your company, you actually qualify for a, a solutions architect. And so you can actually have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with our solutions architect who will actually help guide you through the onboarding process. Um, Kostas, what would you add to that? Uh, we also have some quick start guides and I actually linked that one. So if you want to start exploring on your own before talking to your team, you can do this as well. Uh, we have tried to add guides for several programming languages. So you can ask your developers what exactly they are doing and find um, a guide that is specific to the programming language that you know and, and love. But of course you can contact us and ask for more details if you have a strange use case that we are not, uh, we are not documenting yet. Yeah, very good. Um, okay, now there's another question about, uh, will CodeFresh add an integration with Terraform Cloud for state file storage? Now, I actually haven't set that up before. You can definitely do a state file storage with CodeFresh, either using the built-in storage mechanisms. You can actually store it on CodeFresh and just have the state stored there. Um, would be my first thought. And then the Terraform Cloud, uh, I believe, is accessible via the Terraform uh, CLI, which there is an integration in CodeFresh for. So I believe you'd be able to just pull it. But uh, do either of you have more to add on that question? Uh, I haven't checked if the CLI has it, but if it exists there, you can use it right now today. There is already a tutorial on using Terraform with uh, CodeFresh and I will link to this and you can see that uh, you can run the CLI as you would run it normally. So if you, if you have some special, let's say, requirement regarding the storage file and where it's stored, uh, you can just um, use your own infrastructure. Now, if CodeFresh in the future will add um, infrastructure by itself, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe we could do this as well. Yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, we'll, we'll take that as some food for thought for us to, uh, to look at. Um, Let's see, it looks like we've answered most of the questions. I think I'll call out one more before we end here. Uh, there was just a question about, um, would this work with OpenShift? And in fact, everything we showed you here today would work just fine with OpenShift. Uh, CodeFresh has excellent integrations into Kubernetes, uh, into serverless, into all the cloud native stuff. But we also have people that build Android apps using CodeFresh. We have people that deploy uh, plain Terraform, we have people that deploy to ECS, we have people that deploy to DCOS, uh, Mesosphere, so it's very, very flexible. The great thing about this container-based pipeline approach is that adding functionality is incredibly easy. I'll tell you a story, and we'll, we'll end here. Uh, I was at a, a meetup giving a talk one time with uh, JFrog, and we were basically talking about, um, we were basically talking about how uh, you know, the demo and, and beforehand and the JFrog guy said, you know, it'd be really cool if your demo would push to Artifactory. And this is, this is a few years ago. We have a fantastic Artifactory integration now. And I was like, well, we've got 10 minutes before we were supposed to talk. Let's go build a Docker image and see what happens. And we built an integration for Artifactory in less than 10 minutes, added to the presentation and then demoed it right there. Because all I had to do was basically take the JFrog CLI and stick it in a Docker image. Super easy, threw it into my pipeline and I was good to go. Um, and uh, now people could use it. So thank you so much. I think we're gonna end here. We put a lot of links in the chat. Uh, of course, because you came today, we are gonna send you a copy of this presentation. You'll get that uh, and all the links will be there. Um, as far as the Q&A capture, there was a question if we were gonna be able to capture the Q&A. Uh, Taryn, let's see if we can add some of that Q&A to the follow-up blog post when this is complete, where we post the video um, so that people can uh, refer back to that. Um, good. We can do that. But with that, uh, Vidya, Kostas, any parting words from you? Uh, I think it's important to, you know, to understand that this one-to-one -one mapping between a pipeline and a repository, it's something that Jenkins, let's say, introduced, but it doesn't have to be this way. So you need to you know, wrap your mind around this 
and say, no, this doesn't have to work like this. You can have a single pipeline that works on, on many repositories. And for microservices, this is the best way to do it. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Kostas. Vidya? Yeah, I, I'd say really think in terms of uh, how to reduce bootstrap time um, uh, to, to maximize uh, uh, the resources you have. So uh, to, to leverage um, as much out, uh, out of the box, uh, some of these, you know, the steps, the canary deployment, blue-green deployment, um, the, those are all uh, available uh, no matter what what your uh, business is doing. So I try to think in terms of reducing bootstrap time and, and leverage uh, uh, CICD platform. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you, Vidya. Thank you, Vidya. Thank you, Kostas, for joining the, the Q&A panel. Thank you, Taryn, for, for organizing everything. Uh, you're, you're the best. And thank you, everybody, for joining. This is really great session, really great Q&A. By the way, by implementing this stuff that we've talked about today, we've seen organizations speed up their engineering, in many cases, literally 20 times. I know that sounds crazy. That's a true, that's a true stat. Uh, that's actually underselling it, if anything. So this stuff makes a huge, huge difference in how effective your engineering organization is. So with that, we'll sign off. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you soon. Bye.